And I'm back for part two of the ECH 4123 course introduction slash review of useful material. And in this video, I'll be talking about particularly the useful items, other useful stuff from uh, material and energy balances that you may need. So obviously the mass balance, uh, I said it back in ECH 3023, it's going to be central to everything that you do. And in Sandler's notation, um, he simplifies it greatly by calling it simply the, remember, so in, in ECH 3023, I told you it was in minus out plus generation minus consumption. Obviously for a mass balance, you cannot generate nor consume mass, so those terms are zero. Um, but the in and out terms are simplified to just this one uh, sigma m dot sub k term. So he does this by saying that outflows are specified as negative such that you can just simply have one term, which makes the uh, equation look much more neat and compact. Remember that in a closed system, there are no inlet or outlet flows. So this whole uh, sigma mk term goes to zero, which then leaves you with dm dt is equal to zero. So it says that the change in mass uh, over the change in time is zero. And if you integrate that differential equation, you'll find that the mass is constant. And unfortunately for thermodynamic problems, that'll oftentimes be the case. So a lot of thermodynamic systems are indeed closed. And when you have that, the mass balance really doesn't tell you anything uh, new. So it's kind of trivial in that case. It just tells you that the mass is constant, which if you're looking at a closed system may be more or less obvious just by looking at it. The other possibility is that you have steady state. And in a steady state process, no variables are changing with time, not even temperature or pressure, but obviously not mass in that case. So the dmdt term will go to zero. And then in that case, the sum of all the inflows and the outflows um, should be equal, right? So if you add up everything coming in, that should equal what's coming out. That's a slightly more interesting situation. But again, in, in a lot of these thermodynamic problems, we rarely have more than one inflow or outflow of mass. So again, that's something that maybe more or less obvious. Um, you can also write the mass balance as a mole balance, and this is helpful for if you have a chemical reaction, or sometimes it may just be more convenient to write it on a molar basis if there's a stoichiometry involved that you wanna be aware of. In this case, all you have to do is replace the mass by the moles times the molecular weight. And if you do that in each one of these terms, it'll actually cancel out. So it'll leave you with dn dt, is equal to the sum of the flows n dot uh, sub k. And then for a mole, you can generate or consume a mole of a chemical species with the chemical reactions. There's this additional term here for generation and consumption um, that we handled in material energy balances with the atomic method or with the extent of reaction method. Remember the squiggle methods uh, is preferable uh, or the atomic method is preferable. You can also do a molecular balance those that one wasn't really as preferable, but again, we won't get too much into the mass and mole balances. A lot of times the mass and mole balance will be the easiest part of the problem that you'll have to solve. And oftentimes, it, like I said, it's just trivial. It really doesn't tell you much information that you need to solve the problem uh, by itself. So take, for example, the Joule-Thomson valve. You may have talked about this in your thermodynamics class. Um, so say you have a gas flowing in a pipe on the left-hand side over here where you know what the flow rate is, so N.1 is known, and you also know the temperature and the pressure of this gas. And then by flowing it through this Joule-Thomson valve, the Joule-Thomson valve is going to expand the gas, so it's going to decrease the pressure. And what you're tasked with is figuring out what the temperature is after it comes out of this Joule-Thomson valve. And one of the key assumptions of the Joule-Thomson valve is that it's adiabatic, so there's no heat flows no workflow, nothing spinning or moving or um, no shaft work. We have to introduce that term. That's another one that uh, should be familiar to you. No changes in kinetic or potential energy. So how does the, um, or the, the mass balance, like I said here is trivial. You got one thing coming in, one thing coming out. It said in the process statement that it is steady state. So therefore I have no time derivatives and I have the moles of gas coming in is equal to the moles of gas coming out. Again, not too special. You can look at this and know for a fact that that is true. No chemical reactions. That's something else you have to be worried about when you're talking about moles. Uh, so how do we solve for T2, what the outlet temperature is? For that, we need to do an energy balance. So recall the components of the energy balance. It has the same general terms 
as the mass balance. So I've got accumulation is equal to input minus output. And again, there's no generation or consumption terms because energy is a conserved quantity. I cannot generate or consume energy. So those terms are automatically zero for the energy balance. I'm going to interpret accumulation of energy as the difference between the final and initial states. This is particularly useful in closed systems where I have a final and an initial state. So I'm gonna write the accumulation as the time derivative of the sum of the internal kinetic and potential energies. And in chapter three, I think it is, of Sandler, he starts getting into the notation where the internal energy is denoted by U. The kinetic energy is mv squared over two, so one half mv squared is familiar from physics classes. And the potential energy is the mass times the uh, potential energy function psi. So he's generalizing a little bit here in, in material energy balance. We so just said it was uh, mgh, or gravitational potential energy. Keep in mind that you can have other forms like magnetic potential energy as well, and psi is kind of a catch-all for all of those terms. So no matter what your potential energy field is, this form is uh, much more general. And oftentimes in thermodynamics, we end up getting rid of the kinetic and potential terms anyway, so it's not too much of a consideration. So those terms will frequently cancel out. Don't worry about them too much. Just be aware uh, that they're there in the general term. So that's the accumulation term. Input and output terms we can give by heat and work. So these are the two main ways of which energy can be transferred in a chemical system. Uh, heat is given the letter Q. So a flow rate of heat is Q dot and work is W dot. And work can be further broken into shaft work. So that's something that's spinning. Anytime you hear uh, see a key word like a turbine or uh, a stir bar, something like that, that is shaft work. And expansion contraction work is something that we did not talk about in chem -E because we oftentimes, or in uh, material energy balances, because we assumed that it was a rigid system. But if I have um, an expansion going on, so if you think about a balloon that you put in the freezer, or maybe you, you put a balloon, not in the microwave, but like if you hold a balloon over a, a flame or something, or you're, that wouldn't work either. If you heat the gas that's in a balloon, you can ex imagine that it's going to expand. That can be expressed as PV work. So you've got minus pressure times the uh, time derivative of volume is how expansion and contraction work is written. Um, and then also, if you have an open system, you can transport it in uh, by a mass flow. So if you've got a flow coming into the system, you have to add the internal kinetic and potential energy that is uh, convected into the system by a flow of mass. And then you also have the term for the packet of fluid that flows that does work on the packet of fluid in front of it. So that's called PV work. And again, if any of this is unfamiliar, please go back to uh, chapter three in Sandler is where energy balances are covered. And I'm going through this extremely, extremely fast because um, it should be review. A lot of you said you were comfortable with mass and energy balances. And I'll be sure to go a little bit slower through the rest of the review material um, where people said that they had a little bit more trouble understanding it. So I'm almost ready to put the energy balance terms all together, but before I do that, I wanna differentiate between the extensive variables. These are ones that depend on size. So if I double the size of the system, extensive variables will be doubled as well. So like volume is an example of an extensive property. If I double the size of the system, the volume will also double. I wanna express the extensive variables as intensive, and those are size independent. Those are ones that do not depend on pressure. So an intensive variable is temperature, pressure, no matter what I do to the size of the system, temperature and pressure are gonna remain the same. I can do that, I can make an in extensive variable intensive simply by dividing by mass or moles. So again, remember the notation of Sandler that a specific quantity, so volume per unit mass is expressed as V hat. So if I multiply V hat by the mass, I've got total volume again. So the units again of mass are, is like kilograms or something. V hat would be meters cubed per kilogram, for example. Or he differentiates by having a molar quantity as well. So you can have the number of moles in, as N times V underbar. V underbar is the molar volume meters cubed per mole. All right, so putting it all together in the general energy balance, we got this equation. So be sure to pause the video here and make sure that each one of these terms makes sense. I've got the accumulation term on the left-hand side, and I've got all of the input and output terms on the right-hand side. Oftentimes, when I'm talking about an uh, open system, I want to rewrite it so I can link this term 
I can put it together with this term because it has a common m dot k. And when I do that, I've got u hat plus pv hat. Now remember how we defined enthalpy to be h, and that is equal to u plus pv. So if I do that simplification, I can get a slightly neater form of this energy balance. This is the general form of the energy balance, which would be good for any type of system. I can also write it on a molar basis. So every time I have an M, I'm going to replace that again by the number of moles times the molecular weight. So that occurs in two places. And now I have a general energy balance that's good for either situation. Now back to the Joule Thompson example that I posed above for finding what the temperature is. A good place to start with any energy balance is to start with this equation. I know it's oftentimes tiresome and cumbersome to write this whole thing out, but as you do it, you'll start to develop that muscle memory of remembering what the terms are. It's also good practice just to make sure that if you're ever presented with an unfamiliar situation or something that you don't accidentally forget about something or accidentally cancel something out just because you always start with a simplified version of the energy balance. So you don't have to write this every time. Again, it's just something that I, I like to encourage you to do because that can help you with your understanding. In this particular under, uh, example of the Joule-Thompson valve, the problem again specified steady state. So that means nothing, including energy, is changing or accumulating with time. So the whole left-hand side can be canceled out because accumulation is zero. I also specified, or the Joule-Thompson valve rather, is uh, assumed to be adiabatic. So Q is equal to zero. I have no moving parts, no turbines or stirs, anything like that. So shaft work is zero and nothing is moving, no ex expansion or contraction of the boundaries. So dv dt is zero. So these last three terms cancel out. And then additionally, I'm going to assume that the kinetic and potential energy changes are small. So after all of those simplifications and those, here are those uh, written out for you to copy down if you'd like. What do I have left is simply zero is equal to the sum of the mass flow rate times the enthalpy of those streams. So I only have one stream coming in, one stream coming out, so this is what the equation looks like. And now if I couple the mass balance, so above I said in the mass balance that M1 is equal to negative M2, remembering of course the sign convention. So because M2 is inherently negative because it's exiting, if I take the negative of a negative, I've got back a positive. So I can factor out that M1 term, divide it through because I have the left hand zero, side is zero. I'm left with the enthalpy of side one is equal to the enthalpy of side two. That's why you'll oftentimes hear um, Joule Thompson valves are the simplest example of an isenthalpic process. So coming from the Greek root, root words iso meaning same enthalpy, uh, same enthalpy process doesn't change. Now the problem doesn't tell me what H is. So it's not like I can go and just plug in H1 is equal to H2 and then call it a day. I have to do some more work to figure out what the enthalpy of the system is at state one. I also can't measure it directly. And by that, what I mean is like, you'll never see an enthalpy meter in the lab. In contrast, you, you may see a thermometer or a thermocouple, which will directly measure temperature, or you may see a manometer or a pressure gauge, which will directly measure pressure. So a lot of thermodynamics is built around this dichotomy of measurable properties versus not measurable properties. And oftentimes we'll wanna define these theoretical properties that you can't measure like enthalpy and later on entropy, Gibbs free energy, Hemholtz energy, in terms of directly measurable quantities, um, pressure and temperature. And that's really thermodynamics one in a nutshell. Maybe you didn't think about it at the time, but. We'll keep coming back to this idea of we want to express the theoretical things in terms of things that are practical. So it's a link between the theoretical and the practical. Next time we'll talk about Gibbs phase rule as well. So if I wanted to figure out what the enthalpy was at any point, I would express the enthalpy as a function of temperature and pressure. And I know it's a function of temperature and pressure because of the number of, ex of intensive properties that I have to define in order to set the system. Because temperature and pressure are known, so check the notes above, I can theoretically calculate what the enthalpy is at state one. And then because state one's enthalpy is equal to state two enthalpy, and I know what the pressure is at state two, I could therefore theoretically calculate what the temperature is. And this is where I'll stop for the introductory um, period. And next time I'll tell you that we'll talk more about this business of finding H hat, given what the temperature and pressure is or how to find information about it if you can't calculate it directly. 
Um, and then I'll show you how to simulate this process with Unison. So this is rather important. I talked about this in the syllabus, um, but you will wanna make sure that you um, download Unison and learn how to uh, at least get into the environment as soon as possible. I'll do a quick tutorial next time, assuming that you've already installed Unison. So check Canvas for instructions on downloading it. Remember that you have to be on the UF server um, connected by VPN, or the UF network, I'm sorry, in order to download and access the Unison software. And then before next time we talk, uh, think about what you expect to happen. So in this Joule Thompson valve, I'm decreasing pressure at constant H. So do you assume that temperature will increase, decrease, or remain the same? And if you think about it like it's an ideal gas, you may say that P decreases, and therefore P and T are on opposite sides, so they'll probably likely go together, right? So if P decreases, temperature also decreases. And you might be interested by what you find, because this whole time we haven't said anything about what volume does, and that's another confounding variable which can affect what the temperature is um, given pressure and enthalpy of a gas. So again, we'll see what happens next time. Do some thinking about it. Download Unisim software, and I'll see you next time.